So welcome to Haven Society's AGM. Thank you all for taking the time to be here. Especially thank you to Haven Society members, the staff, the board, the community partners and members who have always supported us in all the work that we're doing. I'm what people affectionately call from time to time the new man. <laughs> I, uh, the transition actually from executive director of Ann Spilker to myself was so seamless that we didn't even have to change our email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> On a more serious note, I want to say how deeply honored and grateful I am for the opportunity to be part of the, and be in service of the very important mission that Haven Society stands for and engages in every day. And that is promoting safety for women, children, youth, and their families in our community here on the Central Island. I want to also express my deep gratitude to the staff of Haven Society who have been dedicated to this mission for over 35 years now, as well as to the Board of Directors. The quality of service and stewardship that's offered by Haven Society is truly second to none, and I'm inspired to be part of this team. We are all committed to the ultimate objective, and that is that there will not be another 35 years of violence in our community. This was a the theme of our 35th anniversary uh, of Haven, which happened this past year, and was a very strong vision of the outgoing and now retired executive director, Ann Spilker. I'm going to keep my remarks short so that you have as much time as possible to hear about the developments of our newest initiative which is a very clear example of working in community, which is the theme of our annual report this year. It's the Domestic Violence Unit in Nanaimo. It's often referred to as the DVU, and I want to welcome you to the world of acronyms. <laughs> I assure you that you are going to learn many of them this evening, and you maybe even perhaps more than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> But you'll even get to leave with a handout that will give you a real clear understanding of all the players that are involved from this community, and there are many of them. The idea of a DVU has been a very long time coming for Nanaimo. It started as a conversation, and perhaps even a dream for some, and certainly and definitely a vision. It involved many people, many organizations, from justice and community service providers in Nanaimo and is definitely a sign of a community working together. That we are standing here today to introduce the development of a DBU in Nanaimo is really, which we're going to be formally launching in the new year, is testament to what can be created when a vision is held with a strong will and determination. One of my personal heroines, Margaret Mead, said it best, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So you're going to meet some of those change makers tonight. First, you'll hear from Sally Fendick, coordinator of the NIMO Community Victim Services, also known as CVS. That was your second acronym. At Haven Society. Sally is going to outline the history of the DVU exactly what it is and how it works and the many people and organizations that are involved. During Sally's presentation, you're also going to hear from and meet some of these people, also change makers in this community. And they are part of a comprehensive team that's dedicated to providing a real quality response to domestic violence in Nanaimo. Then we're going to hear from Mark Fisher, who is the officer in charge of the Nanaimo RCMP. I think you all know that acronym, <laughs> what it stands for. And he will do a keynote address and will end the presentation with any questions that you might have. We're then going to take a short break, have some refreshments, and you'll get a chance to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, and then we'll continue on with our business meeting. I hope that you'll be able to stay for that, because we're also going to be doing some staff appreciations and reviewing some of the wonderful work, aside from the DVU, that Haven Society has been involved in in this past year. So now, without further ado, I'm so pleased to introduce Sally Bendick. Sally is passionate about the DBU and is committed to ensuring that we have a coordinated, collaborative, and comprehensive response to domestic violence in our community. 
She has been one of the driving forces, along with many others, behind the development of the DBU to date. And with the CBS team, she'll be the key partner in the frontline response to highest risk domestic violence in Nanaimo. Welcome, Tracy. Wow, thank you. Um, were you waving something, Tracy? Thank you. You're just saying hi. Thanks. I <laughs> I'm really grateful for your enthusiasm. Thank you. I'm really grateful that all of you were able to make it tonight. And everybody that's coming to speak, thank you also for supporting this. And thank you, Nick, for fixing the whole system that <laughs> fell apart because the electricity didn't work properly. <laughs> Um, um, I get the honor of introducing this wonderful program and its development. This is really a sweet project that we're working on. And when I say we, it's a lot of us. So, i my glasses on. And I guess it wants to go to sleep. So tonight I get to talk about the Nanaimo Domestic Violence Unit and that it's a partnership between the RCMP and Haven Society. But it's more than a partnership between the two groups. It's actually a collaborative effort with a lot of the community that's concerned with violence and relationship. I'm really proud to be a participant in that. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how it's not only um, the group that exists right now, but it reaches far back into the past. For instance, like Teresa and uh, Maggie, they were part of a group of uh, caring individuals that were working on anti-violence and brought forward uh, a project called Beavers, Domestic Violence Emergency Response System. And that was a very beautiful collaborative effort between the RCMP, Community Victim Services, the RCMP, Victim Services, Cheryl's out here somewhere, and there you are, and um, also probation officers. It was a really lovely program that worked with the individuals that were at highest risk of violence. So it really set the stage for the domestic violence unit in my mind's eye. And that program ran for like 14 years, and it wasn't until about two weeks ago, I think, that we closed our last domestic violence emergency response system file. Without real celebration. I, I feel really happy that we were a part of that. So now we get a new project. And this project, again, is about our ability to work together to provide a full service, a full response that cares mostly about safety, but also about accountability and about the collaboration of the community. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> So I want, I'm inviting you to think about violence as, um, like, there's lots of kinds of violence out there, but we're going to be concentrating on the very highest risk of violence cases. And I want you to think about how they're going to be the center of our picture. So I'm inviting you to kind of think about a family. Perhaps you're, it's a neighbor, perhaps it's um, one of your own personal family. And I'm going to name them. John and Jane Doe. And they actually have two children. So I want you to think about what would be highest risk. In this case, we could say that they both have mental health issues. We could say that perhaps um, there's even addiction that's on top of that. But there's been escalating arguments and, and abuse happening. And perhaps you hear uh, one night, oh, they're fighting again. And then you hear a shot. And you say, that's it. Maybe you're the one that actually phones the RCMP and they come and attend. So with the domestic violence unit, the next morning, Shanna, our domestic violence investigator, is going to be, the, she'll be brought to attention about this situation. This family's in trouble. And we now have a way of addressing the collaboration of the community so that we can all support this family. So think of Jane and John in the center of the circle. So, I'm actually, I'm wondering, Shana, if this might be a good time, if you were able to stand up. This is the RCMP constable, Shana Vestigar, that's the domestic violence investigator. 
Um, could you come up and just say a little bit about what a domestic violence investigator does? Hello, and so I'm the DVI, Domestic Violence Investigator, for the Nanaimo RCMP, and I'm basically involved in, in um, oversighting the high-risk files for domestic violence, and I'm there to ensure that it's probably investigated, so uh, Crown Council can have an overall understanding of the dynamics of that relationship, so they can make the appropriate uh, decisions and what action to take. And um, I'm also there to s offer support to the victim and also the offender. Okay, and where I direct them to the various services that are available in the community. And um, I can also explain the differences between the family court process and the criminal court process. Um, as we know, the st statistics do show that there's a high rate of, of, uh, of uh, couples reconciling. Um, in a relationship, so therefore it's important to offer the necessary support to both parties so we can help them prevent recidivism. So, um, next, surrounding, it, at the center we are Jane and John Doe, and then we've got the RCMP, and she's going to give me a call, let me know that there has been a situation, a family that's in deep trouble, and I'm going to become involved, and we're going to contact the client, or the clients, and provide some nice support. And it's kind of like the investigation has begun. It began, began with the RCMP, and then again, now it's starting with Shenna, and then I will be a part of that investigation. So we're kind of looking at um, trying to understand the situation as though each little piece of the puzzle is going to come forward so we can have a better picture of what's going on in that family. So this is the domestic violence unit, the two of us at its most pure state. We're going to provide an enhanced response. It's going to be about offender management. That's going to be mostly Shannon's job. And the victim support is mostly mine. But there's more pieces to this puzzle. Because there's mental health, there's a chance that we want to find out if there's a service provider involved. So we might be calling on the Island Health to come forward and give us be part of the strategic plan for their safety, for their ultimate safety. So there's a consultation and a, a strategy that's important for us around this couple that's in, um, at high risk. And so we're going to come together and kind of ask the clients, the offender and the victim, um, who would be involved in their lives or connected to the to their work. And so, but we're always going to be on the team of the interagency case assessment, right? The interagency case assessment team. But so will the other uh, community service providers. So it could be like Island Health, it could be um, Family Life, it could be uh, Maggie. She might be working with the offender. Maggie is with, uh, has a history, a long history of working with clients. So she's concerned about the offender in a, in a way that's very powerful. And Maggie, I wonder if you want to come up and talk about the importance of being client-centered when it comes to being an offender. So one question that I always ask when somebody picks up the phone and, and asks for help is, is, you know, what was the event that caused you to pick up the phone? Because there always is an event. And after they've described the circumstances, the next question is, is that part of your own best image of yourself? I am generally wary of absolutes, but I will tell you, in all of my experience, the answer is always no. That is not how I want to be with the people, with the person that I love, and with my family. I think that the importance of client-centered uh, uh, response is that we tap into that part of people, that part of men, that part of perpetrators, that part of people who can be violent or abusive, that deeply and powerfully yearns to do it in a different way. One of the things about uh, this team and uh, DBU and all of the collaboration 
is that it allows us to respond in a timely way to that desire for things to be different. Um, so we've been working as a community with a group called the Community Coordination for Domestic Safety Team. Um, and this group is who we would draw from for expertise. And um, they, of course, they guide the integrated process. It's quite a large team, actually. It's like 15 of us. It's 15 different agencies that would be a part of this um, consultation process. So we have like the RCMP and I uh, uh, are always going to be part of that team. That would be our responsibility to be on that team. But also other people at Haven Society, like the Transition House. Cindy, she comes to the team meetings and she's the coordinator with the Transition House and um, representatives from the Children Witness Abuse Program. But also Uh, the RCMP Victim Services is there, the Ministry of Children and Family Development being an important piece of that. Uh, in case the children are at risk, then they need to uh, investigate. We've got community agencies like the Justice Access Center, Crown Council, um, and the Native Court Worker who's here tonight, and Island Health, and the Forensic Nurse Examiner is here tonight. So that's quite a large group. So I just want to go back to that circle theme again and remind you that the clients are at the center. Okay? And uh, that's our work. And I'm wondering if Courtney, you can come up and talk about why it's important that the victim services, community victim services there, and that was the client center. So why community victim services? Community Victim Services practices from a collaborative framework. It draws on individuals and resources within our community, not just within Haven Society. We promote and maintain the understanding that all individuals have a right to safety and integrity. We're promoting and maintaining the understanding of that. Not only is CVS a support service for individuals who have been or continue to be affected by domestic violence, but we recognize the need to rally together as a community so that those can be protected, those that are at highest risk can be protected by their community, and we'll do that until it's no longer applicable. Another value of community victim services being there is that we are trauma-centered. And I'm wondering, Marilyn, do you want to come up and speak to that? Sure. Marilyn's another member of our team, our community victim services team. So, for me, it's really important to work from a trauma-informed lens, and so, that is understanding that not all traumatic events result in post-traumatic stress, but when they do, the result is an overwhelming dysregulation of a person's nervous system. So their bodies react as if the trauma is still happening. They may alternate between fight, flight, freeze responses, and those don't make a lot of sense to observers. So the most supportive thing that I can do is pay attention to my body, to ground myself, to breathe, and then provide a safe, calm presence for the victims. So we've got the domestic violence situation, that's a, a, a risk family, someone you might even know that at highest risk, that needs our concentrated attention. They're not able to manage on their own at this time. We've got the domestic violence investigator, investigator working directly with the situation, plus the community victim services. So we're the DVU team, the domestic violence unit team. This is where you really get to see all those acronyms. <laughs> then we're going to bring together the I count, and that again could be a number of people. It could be the private practitioners, the Island Health, it could be the JAC, the Justice Access Center, it could be the Immigrant Welcome Center. People that would be able to um, give us and share information so that each person would have, be a little piece of the puzzle so that we would have a clearer picture and be able to support this family as best as possible. And we're going to draw from the Community Coordination for Domestic Safety Team. Oh, see how um, we're, I just want to emphasize that we're going to be in each of these teams for consistency, we're, we're linked to all of it. So the Community Coordination for Domestic Safety, GAIN, the Domestic Violence Investigator and Community Victim Services. And by the way, we're allowed to take holidays. 
because when I am out there, then some of the report me is going to be there for my team. And I have a large team, actually. Like I said, wave. <laughs> and some of us are here tonight. Can you all stand from the Community Victim Services? Well, Marilyn, wave, and Courtney. Linda is the program assistant. There's Kathy, she's a volunteer. Karen and Alana. And as I call off these names, like Jack, is anybody from the Justice Access Center here tonight? I didn't see anybody. No family lawyers, but they're on. Private practitioners, that would be Maggie. Uh, the Immigrant Welcome Center, I did see the Immigrant Welcome Center here. Can you stand and wave? Risato and Grim. Transition House is here. There's Cindy. The Children Who Witness Abuse Program is here. Tracy, for sure, I saw. Uh, we've got the Ministry of Children and Family Development is here. Kelly and Pamela. The Native Court Worker is here. Where's Trish? And RCMP, Victim Services. Cheryl, our sister in this. Sometimes Cheryl's group will be the first responders to this, the incidents, and then they will be referring whenever possible to us. Sometimes they do such a beautiful job that the clients don't want to leave their comfort. <laughs> <laughs> and we can work together in those cases. Crown Council is here. Yay. Would you both like to stand up, please, Frank and Jackie? Could you come up and talk about the domestic violence court? We're very fortunate in Nanaimo to have a domestic violence court. And Jackie is very important to that. There are not very many domestic violence courts in the entire province of British Columbia, which is um, different from the rest of Canada, but we're very lucky to have created one here in Nanaimo. The focus of the domestic violence court here it is a court that uh, does not simply focus on punishment. It focuses on a coordination of the services to provide uh, all of the service providers access to the service providers, not only to victims, but also to perpetrators, uh, because the violence doesn't stop unless the men get help too. Mm. Um, and so those services are made available to the accused person in the courtroom. Uh, there's uh, representatives from the various services in the courtroom and, uh, and the focus is on healing the family and keeping them safe. So we have probation officers, uh, Island Health, is Island Health here? Were they able to make it? And the forensic nurse examiner is, could you stand? Just for impact, can everybody that is associated with one of these groups stand up? All of Haven, all of the CCDS, RCMP, this is a community that is concerned about highest risk. And we're doing an excellent job. And you at the back of the table, everybody that's involved here. Uh, so that's what we are, evolving systems together for a safer community. The Domestic Violence Unit is just a wonderful collaboration and it's the focus of a lot of work. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you, Sally, and good evening everyone. I do speak from notes, especially when they ask me to speak for this long, so be patient with me in that regard. I also have a habit from time to time when I speak about issues that I'm quite interested and passionate about to stray. <laughs> so if I get lost in my notes, that's what I'm doing is I'm straying. <laughs> I want to thank the Haven Society for the fantastic work that you do in the community, uh, both you and your volunteers. Uh, this is really, really important work. And it's often work that gets missed in the mix of things. Uh, we as the police are at the front stage of this, and some would refer to that as, is at times the, the exciting and uh, more action-oriented nature of this type of work. But the heavy lifting goes on after that. And I've heard several of you up here today talking about the importance and the support piece of that, both for victims, uh, offenders, and children that get caught up in the mix of domestic violence. And that, to me, is the really important piece, that we don't miss that in communities, because having worked in several very small communities uh, where we don't have access to those types of services, the reality of domestic violence situations is that the police come, they deal with it at the very outset, and then it's off to court, which may happen a matter of months later. And that's really the end of the support for that high-risk family, unless somebody picks up the phone and phones the police again, in the interim between those two, two activities. And they're really left out there in no man's land, which is, is incredibly risky. And the actual likelihood of anybody in that situation changing their behavior for the better is minimal. 
compared to the supports that we have access to in communities like this. Uh, the line of work can be challenging, at times frustrating, and emotionally draining, no matter what sector of this type of work you're involved in. We, we really need to look out for each other, regardless of the sector, and, and check in every once in a while to see how people are doing. Uh, at the same time, though, it is some of the most meaningful and productive work that we get the chance to engage in. And it is. It really puts a smile on your face when you see people, be they children, uh, victims, or offenders in some cases, make that change. You get back on track and you see them in the community two, three years later, and life is better, even though it might have been a total disaster when we first got engaged. So there is hope, and, and we can't lose sight of that. Now, I've got a long-standing interest in this area of work, having grown up in a home where domestic violence was a reality. I know all too well the difficult choices that vulnerable women face on a daily basis. Uh, it's not simply a choice or a simple choice of leaving an abusive situation. And I've been very happy to see in the past couple of weeks the focus uh, in the media. It's sad that it had to get to that to be an NFL player to get that type of focus. But I think there's been a lot of really good discussion in, in national media and, and some local media around the fact that these are not simple choices of leaving a relationship. There is a multitude of factors that, that vulnerable women and children have to take into consideration before they make that move. And we, we can't lose sight of that either, and I know you don't in the support that you provide the victims. Uh, I'm very pleased that the NIMO received funding for this unit. A lot of this was in place well before I got to town, uh, which is about seven months ago. Uh, but there's no doubt in my mind, based on past experience and research into the area, that this is an accepted best practice and the best way to do business if we want to impact community safety. Uh, prior to my arrival here in Nanaimo, I was a municipal police chief in Oak Bay. Prior to that, uh, an RCP officer in charge of the inspector in West Shore Detachment. And as such, I had a front row seat when we developed the domestic violence unit in the Greater Victoria area. We were one of the first out the gate in the province in doing this and formalizing it and dedicating not only police officers, but uh, victim service workers and uh, Ministry of Children and Family Development workers full time in an integrated unit that was actually on site in the same building. In other communities I've worked in, we've seen those groups work together, but not actually in one office where they're sitting together around a table daily uh, talking about these cases, sharing information and managing risk. Unfortunately, we had to get to get to that stage. We had to have the follow-up from the Peter Lee incident, the domestic homicides in Oak Bay, and that's really what pushed people into the table to, to start working together on this and dedicating funding instead of just talking about what a best practice was. That incident forced many of us to examine how we were managing the risks surrounding domestic violence investigations. And we'd always known that these were some of our highest risk investigations, but this incident highlighted the need to establish more formal protocols for the timely sharing of information and safety planning to prevent domestic violence in our community. We learned from that that each agency working in isolation can be doing their very best to protect the victim, but they're only working with the information that they're privy to. And that is one of the beauties of this model. Aside from having everybody at the table, it's the fact that those little nuggets of information that one of us may be privy to may be a game changer when we're managing risk. And I've seen several examples of that over the past few years working with the DBU unit. Often in those cases, one person is privy to that nugget of information. And when it's not shared or discussed in a timely manner, victim and community safety will take a back seat over privacy concerns or assumptions that other agencies must already know that, because I know. So sometimes it's an absolute innocence and, and the assumption that everybody must know that crucial piece. And that's the piece we all miss and makes a huge difference in how we manage either victim safety, our intervention as an agency from the police perspective, or perhaps a decision at the Crown level based on one piece of information that may be missing. One of the results of the reviews of the circumstances of police on the site was a directive from the provincial government to establish the Capital Regional Domestic Violence Unit. Now, there was no new money for it. It simply came down as a directive as a result of, of the review and, that, and the inquest. So that was a challenge for all of us. Every one of the agencies had to find resources or make that very difficult decision to dedicate resources and make sure that they were going to be in place and not simply dropping in in this unit. I, I see us as a, at a similar stage right now in the Nile, and that's why I find it very interesting, the whole creation of this unit, because we lived this experience down there. And we had heated discussions about how can we afford and where are we going to take bodies away from to, 
to dedicate this unit and what results are we going to see? And at the time I was chief of a very small police department with very limited resources and very low levels of domestic violence. So my challenge in, in representing my community and the funding that we got from our municipality is how do we justify spending that portion of our budget when we have maybe one case a year that this unit will handle? And that's what it worked out for us, was one case a year. When I was in West Shore, it was significantly higher than that. But in Old Bay, representing the interest of Old Bay, you have that philosophical challenge around here are very difficult decisions about dedicating resources. And you have to look at that whole high risk piece that uh, there, for the grace of God, go us. We only need one really high risk case to turn sideways on and see the value of that unit. So a lot of the discussions at the early stage, and I'm sure we'll get into this at some stage too with this unit, it'll be easier here in Nanaimo because you're dealing with one police department, one community. Uh, we deal with all the five. So I think that will be much simpler as opposed to competing priorities from different communities that have money and agencies at the table. And sometimes we had to say no, and that was one of the hardest things that the unit had to do at the outset, was learning to say no to some of those cases that didn't meet the highest risk protocol because there's only so much capacity a unit like this can handle. And the last thing you want to do is overburden the people that are committed to this unit so that they do a poor job of all of them. Greater volume, but, but poorer work and poorer quality. And an end result that's not so good and reflects on the unit. So from my perspective in policing, we're careful about which ones we send to those units or send to Jenna to work on because we want to see success. Or for the families that are involved in that, and for the other agencies that are committed to working on these issues. There's one of those times where I stray. <laughs> I think one of the other keys that, that we learned down in Victoria was it's really, really important to have the managers of the different sectors communicating frequently and openly about the challenges when you're working on these units and setting them up. And I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, early communication and frequent communication builds trust and it builds relationships and, and when things do go sideways or there's an issue with one of the, the people that are on the unit you need to deal with that. Uh, working together and communicating about it early makes a huge difference and everybody's on the same page. There's support there and that is, is incredibly important. One other thing we did, I was the chairperson of the management unit of the domestic violence unit in Victoria for the last two years that I was there. So we would meet usually once a month and it would be a representative from different services, a representative from each of the police departments that had police personnel, because there's multiple police in the unit in that instance. And Ministry of Children and Family Development had a representative there. And we would meet just to discuss the business of the unit, around how things were going, and the person in charge of the unit would give us a bit of a briefing, both on the files that they're working on and some of the challenges they were facing, both in resources and workload and we would be able to provide some support there in that regard around uh, keeping the unit focused on their greatest good. So another thing that I think would be very effective here. The other thing we did that's a bit different from other units I've worked in is we had input on selection of the staff across, across agency. And we've done that here as well. I've had discussions with Anne and Sally early on about our selection. Uh, Jen is due to transfer out, so we had to select a, a new police officer for a domestic violence unit. On the past, in the RCP and other police agencies, there are people, we pick our person, and we send them where they're going. Uh, I view this a bit different because of the type of work and the profile of it in the community, as well as the, the emotional touch. You've got to be able to work with the team partners that you've got in this team. It's not strictly about being a good policeman, in my view, and who we select. So we had a person we brought forward, and then I had to meet without me in the room with Anne and Sally. And, and an open door to them to say, hey, if this isn't a fit for you, tell me, because this is really important if we're going to have them doing it. If it's not a fit at the outset, I'm okay with telling my personnel and going back to the drawing table and picking one that is the right fit. Uh, conversely, they have discussions with me around, you know, who do we put on the unit and is that okay with you? Uh, we're doing security clearances for the, the Haven Society members that will be working with us at the police station. They'll have greater access to the police station to speak to our members and meet with them. That's a huge step forward. And again, fit is really, really important when we're talking about things like that. And it goes back to building that trust. You know, I want you to have input into who we got working on this unit. I talked a bit about co-location. That's much more than just a building or a room or an office. Uh, there's a couple other domestic violence units that are being set up in the province under this same 
funding that's been provided. Uh, Kelowna has one, Surrey has one that's being set up. And initially when that came out, the directive was uh, that that be located in the police station. And I took a bit of ex exception to that. A, because they didn't consult with us about it, the province. So that was an issue. Secondly, we are tight for space in our police station. So Anne and I had a discussion about what are we going to do about this, because I don't know that we've got somewhere we can put the, this unit. And we're going to do it a bit differently here, and that our, our unit is going to be based at Haven House, which I'm quite comfortable with. Anne was great to offer up space, and it, it's going to have a bit of a different look than, than the other units in the province. And the two of us discussed this with the province to make sure that that wasn't going to get us in any trouble. And it's not so, again, just doing things a bit differently, but making it work. And the key to having those people together in that same room daily and in the same location instead of popping in and out is all around communication and safety planning. And for me, I view it as bigger than just the police going and doing the investigation and taking the statements and submitting the charge to Crown. This is about us staying engaged and Janet referenced it earlier throughout that process of providing support. And we have a place and I think some value at that table talking about safety planning as that moves forward in between those two stages. So even though our investigation portion is done, we can continue to manage risk because risk can change as you get closer. And it does change as you get closer and closer to that court date. So we need to be at that table to assist or know that we're needed. And I, I think a community partner or another agency is much quicker when they have the relationship with somebody like Jen or our DVI investigator to say, hey, we need a hand with this or this is causing us concerns, what do you think? As opposed to having no police officer there because they're done with their piece of it and then they just pick up the phone when the risk is way up here instead of down here when we can manage it. One of the key challenges that unit faces, faced early on, and I don't know that it'll be as big a challenge here, but it could be, was managing expectations. Uh, people thought because they had contributed a body or money to a domestic violence unit, that that meant they no longer had to do domestic violence investigations, or they're part of them. This unit was going to take everything, and they simply did not have the capacity to do that. So we had to be very, very clear about that, and have some very difficult discussions early on with some agencies. Well, that is not the intent of these units. These, the intent of these units is to manage your highest risk, which what we found in Victoria and I know Vancouver has found the same, is usually around 10% of the cases that come in, which isn't very many. 10% is what they could manage effectively and do a good job of. And I've looked at some of our stats, and it's when I look at the, the files that Janet is actually actively engaged in on a, on a regular basis, it's around that 10% mark. So I found that quite interesting in comparing it to when you have a larger unit and, and obviously more files, but you're still around the 10% point. One other thing we did, and I would like to see here as well, is we leveraged the, the expertise and the extra training that people in this unit got to bring in and train some of the other agencies in the community. So bringing in not only the police members of the domestic violence unit, but some of the community agencies into our police departments to talk about training issues related to domestic violence and investigating domestic violence cases. And there's a huge benefit in that because we can't send everybody to the amount of training that these people will get. But we can leverage the experience that they have from doing these types of investigations and managing that risk to better inform those of, of our agencies or our employees that are out there in the front lines dealing with it in the first instance. Talk <clears throat> very briefly about our domestic stats in regards to the NIMO in particular. So I had our crime analyst look at stats from about the last three years just to give me a sense of, of where we're at and uh, where we're going. One thing I was surprised at is there is very little fluctuation over the past three years in the number of calls of domestic disturbance related calls, right around between 1,050 and 1,000 over each year for the last three to four years, which is it's shocking that it stays that consistent within about 50 calls. Uh, that includes, it doesn't just include domestic assault, so that's not a thousand domestic assault, that's a thousand domestic disturbances. Uh, in regards to assaults, we were around the 300 to 350 a year where we're actually recommending charges. And the one thing that I saw that, if you just look at the stat and don't think about much, might be concerning, uh, I think it was good, is that there was about a 10% increase last year in the number of those files and investigations that were recommended for charges to Crown Council in comparison to previous years. And I like to think that that's a result of better investigation and more time being spent on the investigation to gather the evidence we need to get it to that stage. 
So our numbers have stayed the same, but the number that we're actually referring over on, on a charge has gone up by about 10%. It's, it's dropped a little bit this year, but not significant. So that's good because that's the way we're going to get these people some help and some intervention instead of other agencies maybe not knowing about it or not going to Crown. And I think it's one of the values of having somebody like a dedicated domestic violence investigator involved. One thing that Jenna does that I think she undersold herself a bit on when she was up here. So she takes some of these files and, and takes the lead on the, the high-risk investigations. But she also monitors all those other files to look at the quality of the investigation. If there's steps there that she thinks may have been missed, doesn't mean that she takes over conduct of them, but that she's actually looking at that through her lens and her experience to say, uh, you might want to think about this, or has this been done, or that one's really well done. And that's another key component of her job that I think many people don't realize that she does, but I think provides huge value to, to not only the attachment, but the community. And another talk briefly about how we start small and build from there. And I had a couple of questions about that this week, uh, from, some from police officers, a couple from members of the community, uh, about why this agency isn't in it, or why that one isn't in it. And nobody has ever said, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but that others aren't necessarily going to be at the table later on, but I think it's more important to get the good work started than to wait for everybody to come to that table, and, and I'm glad to see that it is underway. So that's some of the rationale behind how you build these things slowly, and as there's more interest, or agencies are in a position to dedicate body, funds, or whatever the case may be, then you deal with that as it comes up, but you can't wait forever for these things to get going if you want to truly have an impact on, on public safety. We're very lucky here to have the strong level of support and, and interest in domestic violence that we have from our Crown Council. You, you will see, and Jackie referenced it earlier, but there are certain Crown in this province that take a very high level of interest in domestic violence and develop an expertise in that, and there are others where they don't. Not, they're not doing their job, they have a ton on their plate, they do great work. But you will meet certain people as you cross paths with them and get involved at the provincial level in policing and with several integrated government committees, where you meet these people. And you see the passion when they talk about domestic violence and, and the investigations and managing safety. And, and we're lucky that we have that here. And you see it in the ICAP team and you see it in the prosecutions. And it's a definite benefit to us when we're doing our investigations to rely on people that have that expertise and can give us some guidance in our best or feedback on what we're doing well and maybe what we need to work on. One point that gets missed, and this is another thing I saw a huge benefit in in Victoria and elsewhere, and it's I was happy to see how many people up here today referenced it because I didn't know if they would. So I had it in here and I talked to Jen about it earlier today. And I, thought, I don't know that I want to include this, but it's really important stuff. And that is engaging with the offender. And it gets missed sometimes. And if you're not, either from policing or some of the other agencies, engaging with that offender, uh, you're losing a huge piece of this puzzle if you want to have longer-term impacts on community safety. And engaging can mean monitoring to make sure that he is complying with his, whatever the release conditions are, or reporting to probation, or staying away, or engaged in work. Or it can mean when he's doing something right, get the guy a tap on the back and say, we acknowledge that, you know, for the last month, you've actually stayed on track, and that's a good thing, and things are getting better. And the mileage that you get from that little piece is huge to show that you are interested in what they have to say and what's going on in their head and where they're at mentally with this and if they're making any progress or not. So it's really, really important to do that. I was happy to see how many people here recognize that because we miss it sometimes. One of the other things that's a bit different here, I think, is the level of interest and support that I see from, from our local politicians. We have two of them here tonight, the Mayor and Councillor Patchy. In this issue, uh, some communities you won't see them want to talk about this issue or acknowledge it or, or spend the time to, to be interested in it. And I think that's really important. It's important from my perspective because these are the people I go to for, for funding and let them know about what we're doing in the community and setting priorities for placing in the community. And, you know, this isn't the first time that I've seen them show an interest in this. I know they're interested and I've talked to them about it in the past in different forms and occasions. And that is really, really important. The acknowledgement that it's going on and that we need to work on it and do something about it and showing that interest. As well, the media too. Uh, a few calls from media this week about tonight's event and, and an interest in that and some really good questions. You know, often it's just, what are you going to talk about? 
So that wasn't it. It was more around what's happening in France. What do you do to impact that? Why will this work? And who's at the table? So good questions and interesting questions and engaged. So very happy to see that as well. I'm happy to see you guys here tonight. Uh, as the end of all, so I hope that it will provide an enhanced level of service to victims. Uh, they should find comfort in knowing that we're working to support them through the entire process and not just that initial phone call. The approach will prove more effective in the community and it will prove more effective in helping them through those difficult life decisions they have to make as they move forward with their lives, no matter whether they're the wives, the partners, the children, or the offenders in some cases. You know, we have some concerns because we're talking about sharing information. It was actually Karen that reminded me, Karen from our Women's Counseling Program. Um, we're going to be sharing only information that is necessary to save lives. We're not sharing, we're working in partnership with the RCMP, but our obligation to report other crime is, is not compromised. So we're still going to have that level of confidentiality with the clients. It's only in the highest risk of life and limb that we're going to be showing, sharing information that will save lives. Yeah, that is yeah. such a good question. Yeah. You know, like uh, Cindy, like in the transition house, like to, to say that, how can you tell one's highest risk? Right. They're, they're all high risk at times. We can't really tell that. But we have a number of people with a lot of expertise, with a lot of different risk assessment tools, and they have gut instinct. And that's what we're going to be looking at a lot. We're going to be checking on our spidey senses and bringing it forward and consulting. Mm -hmm. We know certain factors like um, uttering death threats and talking about suicide. Those things are always the forefront of a murder-suicide, mm -hmm. right? We know that, sure, how about it? Sally's right, there, there are some key, key factors that, that set off big alarm bells aside from the regular risk factors that I think we would all recognize. Choking is another one. Yeah. Actually, strangulation. strangulation is Think huge. about strangulation as opposed to choking. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a huge one, and, and there's plenty of research out there about that. And one that really police officers didn't realize was a significant a, a risk factor. It's one of the, probably the top 10 to 12 risk factors for, for highest risk cases. I've been a police officer over 20 years. I didn't know about that until probably three years ago. Uh, so there are definite uh, risk assessment tools that we're receiving some training on. And when I mentioned earlier how domestic violence officers get enhanced training, that is one area that we try to focus some training on for them is around formalized, evidence-based risk assessment tools that there is eons of research into that will have four or five factors. And we, we train our officers as well when they attend. We have actual templates that they fill out in regards to domestic violence that address some of these key risk factors. And they're told, even if the, the victims or the initial witnesses don't mention it, maybe in the initial disclosure, if, if those factors aren't addressed in questions to the, the victims and the witnesses at the outset, those officers have to go back and get them addressed because they're internationally recognized as significant risk factors for highest risk uh, domestic violence cases. So those factor heavily into decisions around highest risk. And lastly, especially when you're at a collaborative table like this, those little nuggets of information or, or spidey sense as much as they may not be evidence-based, they play into it heavily. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk to, to victim service workers or children and families, they have made, had way more contact with these individuals prior to this incident than we have, and have gleams of information about the changes in risk that they see that are very relevant to how we rank one above the other. The other piece in, in how you determine what's highest risk is sometimes capacity. And it's sad to say, but it's true. If you're sitting around the table and you're at max, and they're all high risk, as Sally said, then you've got to say to yourselves, is this at that bar? What comes off the table if we take this one off? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not as scientific as the tool. Yes? I know that the funding for these three pilot projects, one of which is the 9 has a time limit on it. So I want to know, when are they going to decide that, that this moves from the pilot project stage? And what statistics are they going to use as markers? Well, that's a really good question because we're not sure what we're going to use as markers. We're hoping to launch this project in the new uh, in uh, the new year, 
and we're hoping to run it for at least another year from there. And, and really, we're trying to embed it into our community so that we'll be able to go forward with it without further funding somehow. I have another question that just yeah. might be my misunderstanding. When these three pilot projects were first announced with the ministry, I had understood that the um, community victim service worker was actually going to attend with the RCMP domestic violence worker to the, to the case. Is that correct? Well, we're not first responders. So Shanna and I have worked out a system that seems to be really wonderful, is that in some situations we'll actually go to the home of the victim and then Shanna will do a, uh, a parameter check. I will be sitting at the kitchen table with the victim talking about scenarios and safety, you know, maybe the knives could go away for a few months, that kind of thing. And uh, we'll work together in a client-centered way for uh, providing service. But we're not the first responders. We're not going to be the ones that are answering the call at 2 in the morning. And I think that they give us a lot of leeway to uh, express this in the way that works for our community. And so each of us, we're not giving a, given a directive. We have some things that we need to do, like enhance the collaboration, uh, take training back to the service providers in our own agencies to get training and be, of course concerned about safety and the children in this case. I know that the children piece was something that was special or unique to Nanaimo. And there's actually seven different domestic violence units that are similar to this, either already functioning or developing like us in the province. Yes? I know she's from outside of Nanaimo and in the Tumult Valley. Um, but the question I have is, where is the training for judges? Um, there isn't any kind of training for judges. Um, and the reality is, in, in the Nanaimo court, that um, we tell them what to do. And, and that's not sort of... <laughs> I don't mean it in that way. What, all of the work that's being done in the domestic violence court in Nanaimo is being done outside the court not being done inside the courtroom by the judge. It's being done through defense counsel or duty counsel or individuals who are unrepresented working with crowds and work with the specialized domestic violence crowds. Because Frank and I are in that courtroom pretty well all the time. Uh, we are specialized. We go from charge approval stage and follow the files right to the end. Um, so there is, there is a, uh, there's file ownership and um, and the files are worked out with the service providers. What's the best services for these people? Are they working with the Ministry of Children and Families? What's happening with the Ministry of Children and Families? What's happening with men's resource centers that are going there for counseling? What's happening with Teresa's group and she's respect? Are they completing their counseling? All of that is being done on the outside of the courtroom, and then we take it inside the courtroom. And so the judges are, um, are they're buying into what we're doing um, by, um, by listening to counsel and by listening to what, what plans we have for the people. Um, and also with the First Nations people, Trish is working very much hand in, in hand with us to provide services, culturally appropriate services for First Nations people too. And those plans are all put before the court. So even though the judges may not be taking specialized training in domestic violence. They're being told uh, by the people that do know what's going on in domestic violence, by people from the ministry, by people from corrections, how these files ought to be handled. And they bought in. Um, they're not dictating to us, no, 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 um, that shouldn't be happening. They're not dictating to us. We're explaining to them why we're taking so they're not taking specific training for it, but um, they know what we're doing, and, and they're trusting the professionals, all of the professionals that are appearing for them. So thank you very much. We'll take a break, and we'll probably reconvene, what, 15? 15 minutes.